afternoon, everyone. It's 4 p.m. and a warm welcome uh, to all members of the uh, European Young Melanoma Patient Group. And a warm welcome to our webinar today around disease and treatment specificities for young myeloma patients. I'm uh, Vince, um, and I will uh, guide you all together with uh, Professor Lelfors towards the webinar today. Um, Linda, next slide, thank you. This is um, about the agenda for today. Uh, so I will be uh, very uh, quick around the, uh, the goal of the webinar. Uh, and afterwards, I will give the word to uh, Professor Delforge for uh, the webinar as such. And we will have time for question and answer. I will come back again on that one a little bit later. And we'll cl close around uh, 5 p.m. Uh, as uh, promised. Yes. Um, before starting the webinar, I would like to give you some uh, couple of, of uh, instructions, housekeeping instructions. Um, you will be able to uh, to ask questions. Um, so you have a um, a little uh, box at the right side uh, under. If you have uh, you see under underneath Q and A, if you click on that one, you will have a box on the right side, and you can ask questions during uh, the presentations. You won't be able to see uh, each other or to hear each other. You will only see the speakers and you will only hear the speakers. Should you have any technical issues, if you don't hear us, if you don't see us, please um, raise your hand. Um, you can see that um, uh, beneath as well. Um, and then uh, we will take contact with you to, uh, to help you and to guide you uh, getting uh, lost from, from your technical issues. Yes? Um, apart from that, apart from the uh, Q&A, you will be able to have a chat. Uh, so uh, the another box will be uh, will be uh, uh, open for you to have chats from with some people or to everyone. So your question in Q&A, please. And um, if you have someone, if you uh, want to talk to someone, you can use the the chat box uh, uh, as well. This webinar will be recorded, so you can you will be able to see the webinar afterwards. And the people who are not able to join today will, of course, be able to see the, the webinar afterwards uh, as well. Thank you, uh, Linda. Just for your for your information, some people um, already know what um, our group is all about. But from uh, for the new uh, amongst us, um, just to give you the mission of uh, EYMPG. Uh, this is providing support uh, to the youngest myeloma patients. What are you talking about when we are talking about youngest people, youngest uh, myeloma patients? It's below 65, below even below 55. And you can see, and Professor Lafosh will come back on that one again. We are presenting about 37% of the population, myeloma population, under 65. Uh, and you see uh, even 10% is under 50. So this is really what our group is all about. And uh, if we can go on the next slide, uh, Linda, please. What is the aim of our group? It's a community. Huh? We are growing every single day. We are growing our community uh, on, of, of uh, myeloma patients uh, under 55 years. From now on, this is an English speaking, an English spoken forum only. Uh, we will see once we can uh, evolve whether we will evolve towards uh, other language, but uh, from now on, we 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 will try to, uh, to 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 guide you in English. Uh, it's interactive, so you have of course uh, possibility to uh, to interact via Facebook, via di uh, diverse uh, possibilities as well. And we are still searching for the best professionals, and we we have the really uh, honor to have one of the best professionals around the the, the table today. What we are not. We are not replacing your local patient support group in your country. This is not the goal that we have. Uh, please uh, keep um, have a touch point with your local uh, patient group. This is really important. We're trying to give an extra dimension on what you can await from a support group. Uh, we will never give um, a piece of medical advice. Uh, we will try to guide you, but we won't be able to. We are not professional personally. Uh, we're not professional to, to give advice on, on, on individual requests. And we are, of course, not uh, top down. So it's an open uh, platform. And um, we are very happy to, uh, to hear your experiences. So if you want to know more, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask questions about it. 
So um, no, I will give the floor, and I uh, it's it's a honor for me, uh, a, a real pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Lafourche. Um, Professor Lafourche took care of my uh, uh, stem cell transplant, so uh, I, I know him very well. Um, he's um, clinical head of hematology at the University uh, Hospital in uh, Leuven in Belgium, uh, and he's uh, also a professor in, in medicine at the uh, University in Leuven. So Professor Lafourche, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vince, and uh, hello, everybody. And it's a true honor and pleasure to be here. Um, and first of all, um, I would like to acknowledge also um, the initiative that um, Vincent Claus and others amongst you have taken to establish, together with Myeloma Patient Europe, this um, support group for young myeloma patients. Although I'm a myeloma treating physician for most of my time, let's say I'm not... Um, um, ignorant to what it means um, to be a patient and to um, be confronted um, at a younger age with, with disease, and especially a disease like myeloma, which completely impacts your life. And the unfortunate reality of life is that at a certain point in time, we all might be confronted with disease, but that's, let's say, more evident at an elderly age. When you're at a younger age, when you're, let's say, professionally active, you have a family, you have eventually kids, the last thing you are thinking about is to be all of a sudden confronted with a severe disease like myeloma. And this has, of course, an impact on life in all the aspects. First of all, and most importantly, we need to fight the disease to avoid that if untreated, it would become even uh, life-threatening. So we want to um, control it and, if possibly, eradicate it. But in addition to that, it's so important that there are support groups to help you uh, get better knowledge about the disease, the treatment options, but also to be in a community that offers also support in all the aspects and to help you to overcome uh, the difficulties that this disease can cause. So I will share my screen now. Um, and um, this should be the right one. Is it okay like yes, this? Perfect, yeah? perfect, yes, perfect. So I've put my timer just in order to avoid that I would be talking too long and we would not have enough time for the Q&A. It is in, let's say, 40 to uh, 45 minutes impossible to discuss all the aspects of myeloma diagnosis or treatment. So what I will do is I will highlight some of the most important uh, aspects. And um, um, let me see if I can now move the slide. I have to do it on my other screen. Um, as already mentioned by... Vince, so it's about 10 to 13 percent of the patients with myeloma that are younger than 55 years. And by chance today, I um, was referred a patient only 29 years young, uh, newly diagnosed my myeloma. She um, is a young mother of a child of nine months and as you know, this has a very significant impact on the life of the whole family that now she's confronted with a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. But the majority of patients are elderly and uh, around one third of the patients is even older than 75 years. One of the most important messages for today is there is a message of hope because um, Myeloma is one of the malignant disease. It is a cancer where um, therapeutic progress has really been impressive. I've now taken care of myeloma patients for around 20 years. And over those 20 years, I've really seen a dramatic change and um, a dramatic improvement in the therapeutic options, but also in a better understanding of the biology of the disease. And we will briefly touch upon these different therapeutic, um, uh, therapeutic possibilities and also how to put them at the highest benefit 
for patients. Something that will also be um, repeated during my talk is the depth of response. And success in the treatment of myeloma is nearly always related to the depth of response by a particular treatment, particular drug or combination of drugs. And um, in more than 95% of myeloma patients, we have this so-called monoclonal or M protein. And that is a kind of a disease marker that allows us to track the evolution of the disease during the whole disease course and during treatment. And um, there are several levels at which we can measure this disease marker. And so we have different categories. We um, speak about a partial response, a very good partial response, a complete response, or a stringent complete response. But unfortunately, despite the fact that patients are in a complete response, that doesn't mean that you are cured. And even patients in a complete response will mostly relapse. And that is because there is still a um, certain amount of undetectable disease at that level. And beyond that detection level, there is what we call the minimal residual disease. And also these days, we have highly sensitive techniques that allow us to measure, even to quantify, this minimal residual disease. And what we do know is that if we reach a level where no minimal residual disease or MRD can be detected, that this is for most patients the best predictor for an excellent long-term outcome. There is a small subgroup of patients who still have detectable residual disease but sometimes they will never relapse or even relapse after many years. And in that small subgroup of patients, the disease is back in what we call an indolent sleeping phase, or sometimes also called an MGUS-like phase. And here, uh, just to show you that, um, and this has been shown in many studies, the red line is MRD negative, um, and that uh, patients who are MRD negative have a longer disease-free and even longer overall survival compared to those who ha still have detectable residual disease. But again, this is for the average patients and we cannot extrapolate to individual patients. Now, just talking a little bit more about the different treatment options. Here you see the different drug classes. And it is not that the drugs we use today have wiped out um, the treatment of the past. No, it all started with traditional chemotherapy and with corticosteroids. And we still use those drugs. But 15 to 20 years ago, this was really the most important part of the treatment. And over time, this has changed because now you see, and that's why I have also put them on top, we have other classes of drugs like proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, which we also call IMITs, and monoclonal antibodies. Proteasome inhibitors, currently there are three on the market that are used for multiple myeloma. They have a very complex mode of action. And as already mentioned, plasma cells, they make this uh, M protein. So these cells, they have a kind of factory inside where uh, the proteins need to be recycled on a regular basis. And that um, can you compare with the kind of a chopper where the proteins are chopped into pieces and those pieces can then be recycled again for making new proteins. So these structures, we call them proteasomes, are present in every cell, but plasma cells are highly, rely, uh, are highly dependent on their proteasomes to be able to make a lot of the abnormal uh, protein of the M protein. And so uh, proteasome inhibitors, they put a kind of a plug 
in this kind of chopper and that just disturbs the whole protein factory in the cell and as a consequence the cell has a high chance of dying. So the proteasomes we have currently on the market for myeloma treatment are portezomib or Velcade, then there is ixazomib or Ninlaro, and carfilzomib or Kyprolis. The immunomodulatory drugs, they have a very dark past because this is the story of thalidomide, which was a drug that was used in the 50s, in the late 50s, in the past century, in particular as a sleeping drug and subsequently as a drug for sickness during pregnancy. Consequently, many uh, children have been born heavily mutilated because of the softenon. Even one tablet of softenon during, during the early phase of pregnancy could have a dramatic impact. So that drug was banned, but because of the fact that it had such an um, important impact on cell growth, in this case of organ development, it remained within the scope of many investigators. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but in 1999, it was shown that thalidomide, which is the active substance, was highly active in multiple myeloma. Unfortunately, the use of thalidomide and especially the prolonged use of thalidomide is associated in a majority of patients with the development of neuropathy, of numbness or tingling in the toes, in the fingers, um, and to a level that it's mostly not reversible. So that was the major drawback of thalidomide, in addition, also causing constipation, fatigue, drowsiness. So very quickly, chemical analogues of thalidomide were developed. And the most important, and those that made it to the market and that revolutionized the treatment of myeloma were lenalidomide and pomalidomide. Now, just going back to, to uh, abortezomib, so the proteasome inhibitors, this is basically the first study. And just to mention that it is in 2003, so that's more than 20 years ago, where it was shown that abortezomib single agent was active in patients with relapsed myeloma. And then a few years later, it was shown that if you combine it also with dexamethasone, that the activity can further be increased. And now I uh, fast forward to, let's say, a couple of years ago, where um, you see the guidelines for treatment of newly diagnosed younger myeloma patients. And with younger here, we mean patients who are eligible for autology stem cell transplantation. Historically, there was an age limit of 60 years. Then it was gradually increased to 65 years. And these days, fit patients up to the age of 70 years can receive an autology stem cell transplantation. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, it's not only about the high-dose chemotherapy and the stem cell transplantation. These days, the treatment we give before and the treatment we give after is as important as the stem cell transplantation alone. And this treatment that we give before, we call it the induction treatment, the initiation of the treatment. And these days, this is a combination of a proteasome inhibitor, mostly bortezomib or Velcade, with an immunomodulatory drug, mostly lenalidomide, where it was in the past thalidomide, and the third drug is dexamethasone. In the past, this was high-dose dexamethasone. Now it is low-dose dexamethasone. And the standard of care is to give mostly four, occasionally six of these induction cycles, then to proceed to stem cell collection, stem cell transplantation, and then sometimes to give consolidation, which is basically repeating the induction treatment for an additional two cycles, and then maintenance with a lower dose of lenalidomide monotherapy. So as you can imagine, 15 years ago, there were 
trials with thalidomide maintenance treatment, but this was very complicated because so many patients developed this neuropathy or other symptoms. Now, what is autologous stem cell transplantation for those who are not so familiar with the concept? Well, basically it is high dose chemotherapy. And um, some cancers are totally not sensitive to higher doses of chemotherapy. But many cancers of the bone marrow or the blood, they are sensitive to higher doses of chemo, which means that the higher the dose, the better the response. But when you exceed a certain level or certain dose of chemotherapy, you will cause irreversible damage to the bone marrow, in particular to the bone marrow stem cells. And consequently, the bone marrow would not be able to recover completely after the high dose chemotherapy. So that's definitely not what we want. So around 25 years ago, it was discovered that if you collect first stem cells, bone marrow stem cells, and then you give the high dose chemotherapy, followed by a reinfusion of the bone marrow stem cells, you can overcome this dose limiting factor. And then shortly thereafter, it was even found that you do not need to take the stem cells directly out of the bone marrow. <clears throat> you can just mobilize the cells from the bone marrow to the blood with a few days of injections with growth factors. So, and that's how it's currently done. Patients get an induction regimen, then they get two to three weeks of rest, and then they get the injections with the growth factors where subsequently the stem cells are collected from the blood, like when you give serum or when you give plasma or red blood cells. Those stem cells are stored at minus 180 degrees until the time they are needed. So to be reinfused after the high dose chemotherapy. And that's currently a very well established technique. The disadvantage is that the average time of hospitalization is around three weeks because the um, stem cells that you reinfuse, they need around two weeks to make the bone marrow regrow. And the high dose chemotherapy gives also temporarily other side effects like nausea, sometimes um, inability to eat and also um, a higher risk for infections. So in most European countries, patients are hospitalized during those weeks. Here you see just an example from one of my patients where you see, let's say the white blood cells is the blue line. Here we give the melphalan. So it takes a, a week before the white blood cells really reach the bottom. Um, here we start the growth factors. Um, and then you see that the white blood cells nicely recover uh, in a time frame of around 12 days. Here you see the red li uh, line is the blood platelets. They have a little bit more time needed to fully recover. So after the stem cell transplantation, as already mentioned, the consolidation treatment, which is not always given, that depends a little bit on uh, the practice at the hospital, also on the depth of response, but that's a limited number of treatment cycles after the stem cell transplantation. And again, usually it's repetition of two cycles of the induction regimen. In very occasional situations, the stem cell transplant can be repeated twice. So um, that is something that is still practiced for a small subset of high-risk myeloma patients. Um, but I think over time, the group of patients that will really benefit from a second autograft will progressively decline. And currently, randomized studies are ongoing to compare a second autograph with uh, optimal consolidation treatment. Um, yeah, sorry, this, uh, I have to move the slides on my second screen, sorry. And this very briefly just shows you that omitting the transplant is maybe not the best thing one can currently do because even with an optimal induction, with consolidation, with maintenance, we see that 
the autograft still prolongs the time to progression significantly. Um, so currently, autology stem cell transplantation is still part of the treatment. And then what about these monoclonal antibodies? Well, a couple of years ago, myeloma treatment was revolutionized once more by the discovery of an antibody directed towards plasma cells. And this was something that has been very long searched for. So currently we have two antibodies that are directed against what is called CD38, which is an antigen that is highly expressed on plasma cells. Uh, we have daratumumab and we have isatuximab. These antibodies, you can compare them with a kind of laser guided um, drug. They also activate part of the immune system. So it's not only by passively linking to the plasma cell, but also by actively recruiting immune cells or immune components that it enhances the killing of the myeloma cell. And very interestingly, this is an add-on on the existing treatment. You can safely combine these anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies with nearly all anti-myeloma drugs with the exception of um, higher dose chemotherapy. And so many studies have been done over the past 10 years to compare the standard approaches of induction, transplantation, consolidation, and maintenance with the same regimen, but with anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody like daratumumab on top of that. This is just an example of one of these studies. And these data have very recently been presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the European Hematology Association meeting a couple of weeks ago. And that's the long-term follow-up of the study and where we see that the addition of daratumumab, both during the induction and during the maintenance, really highly significantly prolongs the time to progression. So what you can see here that um, this, we call it time till progression or progression-free survival, is prolonged with around 30 months. So that's two year and a half by adding daratumumab to the standard of care. And likewise, because the VTD regimen with thalidomide is really becoming very unpopular and is mostly replaced by the V. RD regimen, especially now that lenalidomide has become generic and the price has significantly dropped. So similar studies have been done with VRD with or without uh, daratumumab. And uh, there was the previous slide was the US phase two study. This is the more recently conducted large phase three European study. And also the results of that study have been very recently been published. And what we see is that, first of all, even with a standard arm, VRD transplantation, VRD consolidation, and lenalidomide maintenance, we see that after four years, two out of three patients are still in remission, and only one out of three patients have progressed. But by adding the daratumumab, only around 50 of the patients. So that's um, half of the patients that progressed with VRD alone compared to those who also received daratumumab on top. And this is true for all the subgroups of myeloma, for patients with a lower or a more favorable prognostic score, um, or on the other side, those even with high-risk cytogenetic features. And um, coming back to where I started, um, talking about the depth of response, we see that by adding the daratumumab during induction, consolidation, and maintenance, we see that many more patients achieve complete response. Here you see this is 
88% in the Dara arm compared to 70% in the non-Dara arm. Again, very good results already without daratumumab, but much better results with daratumumab. And then when we look at this detection level beyond complete remission that we call minimal residual disease, we see that patients who did receive the standard arm, we have 32% of patients who were MRD negative, and this doubles by adding the daratumumab to uh, 65%. In the past, it was not done to mention the word cure for myeloma. These days, this is a word we can safely start to use because we, and I would also say myself, I strongly believe that more and more patients with myeloma can be cured and will be cured. And of course, the question is, how do you define cure? When we talk, for instance, about an acute leukemia, we do know that if the patient does not relapse within five years, we can say the patient is cured. Unfortunately, for myeloma, it is a little bit more complicated. Basically, we have to say if the patient did not relapse or the disease did not progress within 10 to 15 years, then probably you are cured. So the follow-up needs to be much longer. And um, again, there is a small subset of patients where the disease has not been eradicated, where there is still measurable residual disease, but relapse will never come. Um, but in order to, let's say, pave the path towards cure, then the question is, which alternative terms can we use? Well, something like sustained MRD negativity. If at repetitive measures, and let's say at an interval of six or 12 months, there are at several time points always MRD negativity. This is already maybe one step in the direction towards cure. But we have to be realistic and we see that at patients who are staying MRD negative for 12 months or longer, that's around two out of three. At 18 months, this is 60%. So it goes down. There will be patients, even despite the fact that they are MRD negative at one or two measurements, they will still relapse after some point in time. So this also impacts the duration of treatment. So probably, and we can discuss later, there is no need to continue treatment indefinitely for all patients. But um, on the other hand, we should also not discontinue treatment too early because this could also increase the risk for relapse. A subgroup that still requires better treatments are patients with what we call high-risk myeloma, and especially those with what we call ultra-high-risk myeloma. High-risk is mostly defined by the presence of specific cytogenetic abnormalities in the plasma cells, like translocation 414, deletion 17P, uh, amplification 1Q. Also, patients who do not achieve an optimal response after these induction and, and intensification treatments or patients who relapse within one to one and a half year, those patients are considered to be high risk. And um, it's clear that even with uh, uh, regimens like DARA VRD, um, the response is not as good compared to those who do not have these high risk features. So specific treatment strategies need to be developed for those patients. And we, as myeloma physicians, we also like to, let's say, repeat this to pharmaceutical companies, to the industry, that it's so important to have separate studies for high-risk myeloma patients and not always to um, include those patients in the standard uh, studies. Just to give you an example, this is a study, a phase two study from Germany, but a similar study has been done in France 
and some in the US, it's um, a, a more intensive regimen where um, bortezomib falcate is replaced by the second generation proteasome inhibitor carfilzomib. So this is with isatuximab, isakrd, not four, but six cycles. Um, then uh, a transplantation, and then four cycles of consolidation and not maintenance with lenalidomide alone or with lenalidomide plus isatuximab, but also with carfilzomib. So let's say this is a more intensive use of the currently available regimens. Um, and these results are promising, but probably also not sufficient uh, for these patients at high risk for a rapid relapse. Now, um, and this is just one slide I want to show. This is for the elderly, because there are more and more now similarities to how the newly diagnosed elderly patients are treated compared to younger patients, because this is from a very recent study. And this is a study with VRD plus isatuximab for newly diagnosed elderly patients. So that's very similar to, let's say, DARA VRD for the younger patients, with that difference that no stem cell transplantation is offered here. But uh, just a longer phase of induction plus consolidation is given. And time will tell. Uh, to what extent these results are comparable um, to the results in younger patients with transplantation. It's too early, but based on what we currently see now, it looks that the results with the stem cell transplantation are still superior to these similar treatment approaches for elderly patients, but without a stem cell transplantation. So this treatment is, let's say, in continuous movement and in continuous improvement. Now I'll switch for the last 15 minutes of my talk to relapsed uh, setting. And um, so when the disease comes back, and again, this is the reality for the majority of patients, then it can be even more complicated because um, first of all, there is the disease, there is the patient, and there is the treatment history. I hope, uh, fortunately, not too often, uh, the biology of the disease can change. Um, so an additional mutation can be acquired, and the disease can sometimes be more aggressive at relapse compared to at time of first diagnosis. But again, this is not the standard. This is more the exception. Um, Patients at time of relapse are older. They can um, have some other diseases. Um, of course, when there are multiple relapses, it's important to see which treatments have been given, which treatments worked well, which treatment did work very well, which was well tolerated, which was not very well tolerated. And um, last but not least, we also should go for a shared decision-making with the patient and also listen to um, the voice of the patient. What does he or she expect? Just to show you here that um, these treatment algorithms at relapse, they have become much more complex over the years. And this is some good news because it just shows that there are many more options, but sometimes also one can get lost. Um, and that's something that I hear frequently from um, younger doctors that they say, oh, this treatment of myeloma at relapse, it's so complicated. Well, it looks complicated, but it shouldn't be too complicated. But it's very important to follow a um, logical um, approach that is driven also by data, by evidence, and not by intuition. These guidelines will be updated very soon because also at relapse, the landscape of myeloma treatment is being revolutionized. And um, these days at relapse, one of the questions we ask ourselves when it comes to the treatment and the disease is, okay, did the patient already receive lenalidomide? And mostly the answer is yes. Um, but then the next question is, did the patient receive lenalidomide until progression? That means the disease is not sensitive anymore to lenalidomide. Or um, was the 
uh, disease uh, already is a disease already resistant. Huh? And if the disease is resistant, it's not a good thing to um, use a lenalidomide-based regimen, and you have to go to other treatment regimens. But as you can see, there are many options. Although, another question we ask ourselves now that we are using more anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies labs, is it not only resistant to lenalidomide, yes or no, but also is it resistant to an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, daratumumab or isatuximab, yes or no? And if at relapse the disease is resistant both to lenalidomide and to an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, as you can see, the treatment options all of a sudden become much more limited. And that is a consequence of using more active combinations up front, and especially until progression, that has a significant impact on what you can do at relapse. And especially at later relapses, when several treatment options have been given, it can become much more complicated um, to find a good treatment. And this is what is in our, let's say, terminology frequently used. This is triple class refractory myeloma. That means that the disease is refractory to a proteasome inhibitor, to an immunomodulatory drug, which is mostly lenalidomide, and to an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. And just as an example, this is something that we published two years ago, that is a survey in Belgium where patients with triple class refractory myeloma they received more than 50 unique treatment regimens, but mostly this was a recycling of drugs that were given in the past in all types of combinations. But unfortunately, the results with these combinations were very disappointing, and also the treatment duration was very short. So there we are again, very um, fortunate that we are now in the area of the new T-cell redirecting therapies or the new class of immunotherapies. Um, so very briefly, these agents, they are directed towards specific antigens on the surface of the myeloma cells. And the most commonly used targets are B-cell maturation antigen or BCMA and another, this is a complicated one, GPRC5T. And the first one was an antibody like daratumumab or isatuximab, but an armed antibody. That's an antibody that is linked to a molecule of chemotherapy, an antibody drug conjugate, as we call it, directed towards BCMA. And that drug is called belantamab mafodotin. Secondly, there were the bispecific antibodies developed. And this is an antibody that with one arm grabs this antigen like BCMA or GPRC5T, and with the other arm, it grabs an immune cell and it brings the immune cell towards the myeloma cells. And then the third option are the CAR T cells, the CAR T cells that are genetically modified immune cells from the patients. So a new receptor is added in the cell, which directs it to an antigen like BCMA. So very briefly, to start with the CAR T cells, um, currently, they, it's been proven they are very active, but it's still a complex procedure, and it can easily take up to eight weeks between the um, uh, apheresis, so the collection of the cells, and the infusion of the CAR T cells, because in most places, they are commercially produced, although in some centers also academically produced CAR T cells are used. And also uh, there is now technology that allows sometimes decentralized or local manufacturing, or let's say um, putting the compounds together. So therefore the vein to vein time, as we call it, becomes much shorter. The results with the CAR T cells are very impressive in patients who have who had exhausted all the options. So in this triple class refractory patients, we saw with one of the CAR T 
product a progression free survival approaching three years, whereas was with all these combinations sometimes only three months. So that was really uh, revolutionizing. Um, very importantly, with CAR T cells, it's only one infusion. Patients are hospitalized for, let's say, an average of 10 days, but then they have an excellent quality of life because they do not need to take continuous drugs like lenalidomide or have to come on a regular basis to the daycare clinic for injections with daratumumab or with falcate or infusions with kyprolis and so on. Studies have been done to compare one single infusion of a CAR T cell with standard of care regimens at relapse. So they prove superiority, but it is too early to tell if these studies will also improve the long-term outcome or the survival as we call it. And that is exactly what most regulators require before they will start talking about potential reimbursement because a CAR-T treatment is also very expensive. But again, the first results look very promising in terms of efficacy and show in terms of response and progression-free survival and MRD negativity and so on, superiority of one infusion of CAR T cells compared to standard of care regimens. I'm going to skip this for uh, time reasons, but CAR T cells can be associated with specific adverse events, especially um, shortly after the infusion, there can be an inflammatory reaction, which is logic because you activate immune cells. So you give immune cells that target cancer cells. So this gives an immunological reaction. But um, this is what we call cytokine release symptom. And sometimes this can be associated with temporary neurological side effects uh, like a headache, confusion. But um, there are also CAR T cell products for other hematological diseases like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And those products are associated with much more neurological adverse events compared to the CAR T cell products that we use in multiple myeloma, but still it can occur. There are also a few cases reported of long, uh, late onset Parkinsonism after CAR T cell infusion. It's very rare, but uh, for some patients, this can be a concern to step, for instance, in a clinical trial with CAR T cells. And then finally, a few words about the bispecific antibodies. So these are these antibodies that physically connect the plasma cell with an immune cell. And also this has been a major step forward in the treatment of multiple myeloma. Currently, we have bispecific antibodies directed against BCMA and against GPRC5T. And these are also data from triple class refractory patients, so patients who had received an average of five lines of treatment, where we see that a response is achieved in two out of three patients. And importantly, a complete response is achieved in 45% of the patients. And if patients achieve a complete response, the time to progression can exceed two years. Again, with classical approaches, this uh, time to progression was around three to four months. Um, but uh, bispecific antibodies can also give side effects. There can be this inflammatory reaction that we call CRS, but it is less pronounced compared to CAR T cells. And the same is true also for these neurological adverse events. And on the next slide, I explain you how uh, or, or what is the reason for that. Well, this is because with CAR T cells, you have to give all the cells with one infusion and then the cells start to expand in the body. But with bispecific antibodies, we have a kind of stepwise approach. We start with a very low dose. And if that's well tolerated, two to three days later, we give the second dose. And if that is well tolerated, we go to the therapeutic dose. So by doing that, you spread the risk for severe cytokine release uh, syndrome. 
by specific antibodies and especially those that target BCMA increase the risk for infections. And myeloma patients who have received many treatment lines are more vulnerable for infections because their immune system is more exhausted. So um, this is something we need to pay attention to. And um, uh, over time, we have also learned how to better deal with those infections. And on this slide, I summarize some of the things we do as physicians that, first of all, you should never start such a treatment if there is an active infection. Uh, secondly, um, we have to screen for some viral infections before we start giving the drug. Um, during the treatment, we give patients prophylaxis. So that means um, medication to prevent uh, specific infections, like for instance, um, uh, uh, Zona, which is uh, this viral infection, um, uh, which calls shingles. Huh? Um, and also, uh, it is highly recommended that most of the patients who receive a bispecific antibodies, and also in the first month post CAR T treatment, we give intravenous immunoglobulins uh, to further reduce the risk for infections. And by these strategies, uh, we can significantly reduce the risk for severe infections with BCMA targeting by specific antibodies. Um, and then finally, this um, by specific antibody directed towards this other antigen, which is GPRC5D. This is also highly effective in patients who have received many uh, treatments. And all these bispecific antibodies also are now moving to earlier treatment lines. There are also studies ongoing where bispecific antibodies are given for newly diagnosed patients, for instance, uh, for maintenance treatment or in elderly patients in combination with daratumumab and lenalidomide. But with the GPRC5D targeting bispecific antibodies, there are there is less risk for infection, but um, the majority of patients will lose their taste. And this also has an impact on the quality of life. Some patients will have skin rash, or also there will be um, a kind of uh, impact on the formation of the nails. I must admit that I have treated, or I am treating many patients with this compound, and no patient stopped because of these adverse events, but sometimes you really need to uh, intervene to avoid that because of the taste loss, patients would start to lose too much weight. And this just shows you that both CAR T cells and um, the bispecific antibodies are now uh, being explored in earlier lines of treatment, comparing them to standard of care regimens or using them as an add-on to further improve the uh, depth of remission. So in conclusion, I think it's very important to know that younger patients with multiple myeloma, they do not have an inferior outcome compared to elderly ones. In contrast, younger patients have by definition many more therapeutic options. For newly diagnosed patients, these days we are stepping away from the triplets, so like VRD or VTD, to the quadruplets where we add an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. But for the time being, autology stem cell transplantation is still an important part of the first line treatment. And during the following years, we will see um, further uh, use and further optimization of the use of T cell redirecting therapies, not only in late relapse, but also in earlier relapse and at the time of the first treatment. And this will definitely further improve the outcome of myeloma patients. We didn't have the time to talk about supportive care, like the use of uh, bisphosphonates, the prevention of infections, the treatment of infections, the protective kidney measures, but um, that's probably for another session, but we should always keep in mind that's also a major factor uh, to optimize the myeloma treatment. So I'll stop sharing and I hope we still have some, a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm sorry I run five minutes late. Many, many thanks, uh, Professor Delforge. It was uh, really, really interesting and um, very hopeful. Uh, and your conclusion is, is clear. We have solutions for newly diagnosed myeloma patients. We have solutions for relapsed uh, uh, patients. 
And this is the second time in two weeks that I'm hearing the word cure. So we had a lecture last week uh, so with an MP and uh, a colleague of your uh, a colleague of yours in, in, in Germany used the same the same um, uh, words cure and I think that's we are the first generation of myeloma patients who are hearing the word cure and and it's 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 very uh, hopeful so thank you again we have indeed a, a couple of questions uh, professor uh, so uh, let me uh, start with um, the first one um, by uh, Fernando. Do you have any routine to measure MRD in the management of myeloma patient and for sure for the young patients? Yes, um, so it's still, let's say, an ongoing debate, but for the time being, um, every patient who achieves a complete remission, that means we call it a biochemical complete remission, we don't find any more the M protein in the blood, in the urine, then we do the bone marrow for MRD assessment. And that's a way of better categorizing the depth of response. And since it has an, uh, is a predictive factor for outcome, even if it's not yet a um, determining factor for treatment decision, I think it's important to measure it. And then we repeat this every six to 12 months. We don't want to bother patients too much with bone marrow aspirations. And there is also a lot of research ongoing for MRD measurement in the blood. So it's not excluded that in a few years from now, we will definitely have to do bone marrow aspirations once in a while because you get a lot of information there. The disease originates basically in the bone marrow, but maybe uh, intermittently we can then measure MRD in the blood. Clear. And thank you about the comment about blood because it was it was the second part of the question. So uh, thank you for that. Um, is the uh, stem cell transplant procedure recommended uh, at relapse? It's controversial. I must admit that it's my own, um, let's say, personal advice. Over the last years, we have done very, very few autologous stem cell transplantations at relapse because you have so many other options. But for instance, if a patient has an very, very long um, response after the first stem cell transplantation. And um, let's say you still have stem cells and with the retreat, but with, with the second line treatment, there is a suboptimal response. You could consider doing a second transplant. Right, yeah. Um, another one, um, there are a couple of research uh, and do we have any idea on the benefits, of, uh, benefits versus risks of maintenance therapy for younger patients? Excellent question. So um, maintenance treatment, really the benefit outweighs the risks massively. So with lenalidomide, very briefly, so there was, let's say, 12, 13 years ago, there were some concerns about what we call second primary malignancy, so secondary cancers with prolonged use of lenalidomide. But um, uh, very briefly, um, we do know that we should not use lenalidomide in combination with specific cytotoxic drugs, what we call alkylating agents. Um, and um, on top of that, we do know that prolonged use of lenalidomide, it increases a little bit the risk for superficial skin cancers, um, especially um, when you have a lot of sun exposition. But um, that that's, those are not invasive cancers. These are these um, superficial things that they can treat with laser or with cryotherapy. Um, but um, on the other hand, I'm also advocating a limited use of lenalidomide for many patients, especially those in CR or MRD negative. There is little benefit uh, currently to say, well, to continue for lenalidomide with an open end. So also uh, many studies that are currently ongoing, they limit the use of lenalidomide to around three years, especially for those who are in complete response. Sure, sure. Um, question from uh, Dimitris. Um, in some older papers, it was mentioned that the different myeloma subtypes based on Ig, uh, different risk profiles, um, for instance, IgA, worse than IgG, etc. But this again seems to be rarely discussed in recent papers. Is there a reason for this? Well, that's correct. I think in the past, um, also like IgD myeloma was considered to have a, a poor prognosis, but um, this is probably 
partly driven by the fact that uh, since this this IgD is diff uh, is sometimes uh, difficult to detect or it takes longer that at that point in time there was already more organ damage but um, the prognosis is not driven by the type of protein it's more driven by the biology of the disease so more what is inside the cells rather than which paraprotein do they produce of course the 15 percent of patients who primarily have light chain production are at higher risk for kidney damage right Okay. Maybe a last one, just uh, for sake of time. And sorry, uh, I will try to uh, to get answer on the uh, on the uh, other questions uh, and send the the, the answer uh, afterwards. But uh, a last one, uh, Professor, is uh, smoldering myeloma uh, for younger patients. Um, do you try to wait a little longer, specifically for uh, younger patients, when you're seeing from smoldering? Yeah, we are currently debating a lot about uh, smoldering myeloma, but very briefly, you, you know, in smoldering myeloma, you also have different risk categories. And so patients with, let's say, a high risk smoldering myeloma, there you could consider treatment or enrollment in a clinical trial. But patients without high risk smoldering myeloma, we don't think there is currently enough evidence to start any treatment. Um, what is important is to, to have appropriate uh, monitoring. Um, but again, it, it's ongoing debate, but over the time we have already reclassified patients with high risk smoldering to myeloma with these slim CRAP criteria. Um, but again, if the disease is stable with smoldering myeloma, my personal feeling is that keep a close eye on it, but don't start treatment too early. Yeah. Especially since we have now again this 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 area where where treatment upfront is changing, and if possible, waiting a bit longer can be also in the benefit of when treatment is needed, that the treatment might be even more active. Good. Perfect. Thank you a million, uh, Professor Alforge, in the name of the, uh, the patients here and and the ones who will follow the the webinar after all on the on the replay. Um, if you're okay, we'll provide you the uh, some questions that we. Yes, yeah, sure. Just, just uh, the, the if if for whatever reason I could uh, be of any help, never um, wait to reach out to me. Perfect. And I wrote down that the supportive care can be uh, one of the next webinar together with you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thanks thank so much. All. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And all thank the best. you all for being here. Bye, bye, bye everyone. Bye.